playing muscles at the backdrop of a fight. As Ukrainian troops desperately resist the onslaught of the Russian army, NATO is strengthening and increasing its combat capability on Europe's eastern borders. From NATO's point of view, these are precautionary measures, while in Moscow such actions are called aggressive behavior. The war in Ukraine boosted the alliance's gain in power, although this is exactly what the Kremlin tried to avoid. President Putin hoped that his war on Ukraine would divide NATO. Instead, he's united NATO in support of Ukraine and in defense of its own members. He's brought countries around the world together to support the fundamental principles of sovereignty and independence. They see what's happening in Ukraine as a direct result, uh, excuse me, a direct assault on the foundation of their own peace and security. That is why we will continue to stand with a democratic, independent, sovereign Ukraine until this terrible war is over, and for that matter, long after. According to the Russian authorities, the Ukraine war is not a confrontation with Ukraine itself. The Kremlin speaks of a conflict with NATO against the background of the ongoing hostilities. We are NATO. Мы воюем с огромным вооруженным противником. Да. Наверное, не так просто России одной сражаться со всей НАТО там. Although the Kremlin rhetorics became contradictory like never before. First a three-day special operation, then the demilitarization of Ukraine, then the Third World War, and finally the war with NATO. Moscow no longer knows how to deny its desire to destroy Ukraine. The reasons for this desire date back to 1994, when the Budapest Memorandum on Security Assurances was signed. Ukraine then renounced nuclear weapons. By the way, there were also accusations from Russia about NATO enlargement. But the main thing? The Kremlin thought that now Ukraine is defenseless, so it must be captured. After a meeting between the US President Clinton and his counterpart Boris Yeltsin, an agreement was signed between the world's strongest powers. The young and the independent state of Ukraine is left alone with an inadequate neighbor. For the Russian mentality, this is accepted as a gift. The same goes for 2014. If the annexation of Crimea and the occupying of Donbass by the civilized world is perceived as a violation of the memorandum, the aggressor emphasizes that this is only legitimate booty in terms. Instead, full-scale Russian aggression has allowed NATO to continue to expand with Finland and Sweden. The length of the common border between Russia and NATO will double to 1600 miles. And judging by the reaction of the alliance, this situation suits them well. Instead, the issue of occupation of the Ukrainian Black Sea coastline remains one of the most acute problems for both camps. Russian shelling of Ukrainian cities from the Black Sea shows a significant threat to European countries including Turkey. A complete blockade of the Black Sea is destroying part of Ukraine's export-oriented economy. Russia failed to seize Kyiv by force, so they moved on to a plan to force signed the capitulation, so they are trying to seize the south of Ukraine, outright trading stolen grain and threatening the world with famine. The arms supply plays a crucial role here, and it's just as important for Ukraine's existence as for the security of NATO countries. Today we also discussed uh, the important decisions we will take at the NATO summit in Madrid later this month. We will agree NATO's next strategic concept strengthen our deterrence and defense and prepare for an age of increased strategic competition with authoritarian powers like Russia and China. This includes working even more closely with our partners in the Asia-Pacific and other like-minded partners around the world. The NATO summit in Madrid is to raise issues that were considered top priorities for the world community at the beginning of the year. Prior to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the alliance placed China at the forefront of geopolitical threats. Under the new conditions, the strategic concept, which sets out a plan of action for decades to come, will surely change the priority. And it will focus on Russia, not China. This is also due to 
Europe's attitude towards China, which is not the threat mentioned at the beginning of the year. The winter meeting of the leaders of Russia and China at the Olympic Games is perceived as Moscow's search for support for its actions in Ukraine. If NATO's priorities in the long-term strategy are shifted, Beijing's neutral position will bring far more benefits to China than open support for Russia. After all, China chooses between two options – to put a risk on $150 billion in trade with Russia or to lose $1.5 trillion, which are jointly generated by the United States and the European Union. Meanwhile, every day or week of procrastination in this war only deepens the crisis and increases the amount needed to restore the balance after the war.